Kia ora, welcome to Parliament TV. The following story comes from the TVNZ Digital Production Library. David Longy resigned as Prime Minister on the 7th of August 1989. This report comes from the Homes Programme. I came in in the extraordinary circumstance of the Mungu by election and thereafter it was a roller coaster. And I think that that is a type of lifestyle which you have to call an end to, otherwise it will call an end to you. I remember my brother carrying the can yet again of someone connected with a politician who, when he won a Queen Elizabeth II Arts Council grant to glaze, was asked immediately by the Auckland Star, that bastion of sensitive, faithful journalism, have you received this award because your brother is the Prime Minister? And he said, the only reason why my brother's the Prime Minister is because I am a famous potter. <laughs> and I think that's the sense of perspective which New Zealanders should have about any sort of job. I'm going to stay as the Member of Parliament for Mangri. I've got other things to do. Only a few weeks ago in here you said that one of the most boring jobs available was being a backbencher. That's right. How are you going to relieve the boredom? Well, you can do things that you can't do otherwise, you see. You can do things like um, talking. Uh, all sorts of possibilities arise. So I've been offered a ride in the Milan to Maligua car rally. I've done all sorts of things. I mean, you know, well, I, I can there's always a loser somewhere prepared to back it. I remember when you were a backbencher before and you were ceaselessly bored. <laughs> that shows you how honest I am. What was the Cabinet reaction to your, uh, to your announcement this morning, Prime Minister? The Cabinet was... Uh, I think it was a, a very warm cabinet. It was a cabinet that uh, I certainly relished. We were, I suppose, as you do within the tribe, you become you become tribal and you think of the good things, think of the achievements. Uh, and it was good to walk out of there while I stood in Clapney. What are you going to miss from the job? Press conferences. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from that weekly highlight. Oh, more often. Oh, there's lots of things you miss, and there's lots of things that you're glad you did, and uh, uh, lots of things you don't sort of like. Like what? I don't know whether you've ever tried to order a breakfast in a New Zealand hotel, but I have yet to get one that I ordered. <laughs> <laughs> who were some of the people who tried to dissuade you this morning? Oh. You people contacted you from afar. From afar, all over the place. Uh, <clears throat> from all sorts of places, all sorts of uh, messages, and I think that I would... Uh, certainly respect them and I did and it was a very it's been an extraordinary uh, what six, I don't know I landed here at about 20 past 5 last night and uh, apart from snatch sleep uh, never knew I was so popular behind me we have a prime minister <laughs> he was the youngest New Zealand prime minister this century a man with a razor wit, a man with a vision. That we're going to really get stuck in for New Zealand and we're going to do that. In the early years, there were massive changes. The dollar floated, the markets deregulated, the subsidies slashed and the nuclear ships shut out. I'm afraid that we were not able to resolve that issue. David Longy became a messiah for the nuclear free movement, doing battle on the international stage. For whether you are snuggling up to the bomb or living in the peaceful shadow of the bomb, New Zealand benefits, sir, and that's the question with which we charge you, and that's the question with which we would like an answer, sir. And I'm going to give it to you if you hold your breath, just for a moment. <laughs> I can smell the uranium on it as you lean towards it. <laughs> we proved that uh, oratory can be used in many different mediums, um, and particularly television, and he used that in the Oxford Union and a number of other occasions through different crises such as uh, Fiji uh, and the Rainbow Warrior and indeed the whole ANZUS uh, dispute. He showed that he had a real ability to, uh, to communicate a message to New Zealanders and of course was uh, a major reason for uh, the government being re-elected in 1987. But it was behind closed doors inside his own cabinet that David Longy would fight his toughest battles. The old fish and chips brigade turned decidedly soggy. Roger Douglas is the economic architect of this government. The Longy government stands or falls alongside Roger Douglas. And those who seek to take him captive away from me 
will be out in the political wilderness for a very long time to come. But it was David Longy who would struggle to gain control. In the euphoria of the first years, he somehow lost the economic rudder. The vision remained the same, but the means became decidedly different. The driving force became Rogernomics. David Longy's health was already deteriorating, and the pressure on the Prime Minister began to tell. Anyone who takes over the job as Prime Minister is very, very difficult. It's, it's not a, it's something which involves an enormous amount of time, uh, effort, and a personal cost because you give up that freedom that you've previously had. It's a, it's, it's a kind of uh, uh, job which, which requires total commitment, and he gave that. After the 1987 election, with Labour again entrenched firmly in the Treasury benches, Longy attempted to reel in his finance minister. He did it with Roger Douglas out of the country by canning his flat tax policy. Later, he called for an economic breather. I believe the people are saying to us, look, we don't want you to do a U-turn, and we won't. We don't want you to go and say you were wrong, and we weren't. But what say we sort of have a little breather here, <laughs> and then we'll set off on the road again after we've sort of picked up the casualties and, and, and had a cuppa. To the Douglas camp, that seemed like a declaration of war, a war of words that was to last 18 months, which led first to the sacking of Richard Preble and then the resignation of Roger Douglas. Over the past year, a conflict has developed between David and myself, which I cannot understand or explain. It has persisted and been continually renewed despite my best efforts time and again to resolve it. Always in Cabinet there is debate, always there is discussion, uh, never are there rows. But the battle continued. In six months there have been two attempts to roll Longy. Both have failed. You've boasted in the past though that um, Labour Party policy has been subverted by your government. It was a boast you've made before the 87 campaign. Labour Party policy has. While you were Prime Minister? Yes. What's to say it's not going to happen again? It won't while I'm there. But it's happened before, no, it's hasn't it? Yes. What's changed? I've changed. I want us to go from here tonight, working for New Zealand, rejoicing that we have had this victory and then... David Longy has changed in five years, but his vision remains the same, even though his cabinet ministers have proved they can't work together. I have uh, taken a great deal of counsel from a variety of sources. I am looking forward to a very healthy future. <clears throat> it will not, however, be as Prime Minister. He's done what? He's done what? Who's done what? Longy's quit! Come on, let's go. Get your instruments of transmission. We'll let's go and see go what the people have to say. Okay. Speed. Come on, let's go. Got the car keys? Yep, yep. Which one of you's got the car keys? One of us. He's got the car keys. I thought I had them. Hi. How are you? Have you got a reaction to David Long? He's quitting. Yeah, I'm really disappointed. I'm really upset. I felt like sending him a telegram. Why? So I think he's good. Think he could have done it? I think he could have stayed there, yeah. The Mangari Town Centre, here we are in Mangari, and Mangari is the Prime Minister's patch. We'll head over there to the shopping malls and to the town centre and get their reaction to what's happened today. It's a sad thing for him just to drop like that. I think the country might feel a bit sad. Sad? It's been sad a long time, my friend. I think he is really wrong in resigning. Prime Minister of New Zealand is resigning. I think it's sad. Because he had about 43% voting the other night. Mr. Long, he's gone. Uh, yes, no, I don't want to interrupt. He was quite good as a prime minister. I feel in, in, in what sense? Uh, well, just the way he was. Generally, yeah. I don't like him, so... Um, Why did you not like him? Well, he hasn't really done much for the country, has he? Oh. It's not in a very good way, is it? So what do you think of this news, then? What news? Oh, pardon me? Are you yeah. sad about this? Well, I don't know. I don't know whether it's good, bad, or otherwise, I don't know. And what do you reckon about it? Not much, really. <laughs> I don't think much of it. You don't think much of it? No. no. Think he's a good Prime Minister? No. No. Well, I think they're all basically the same. It doesn't matter who's in at the moment, you know. 
or who gets in. I, but personally, myself, I think if you get a woman up front there, the country would not be in strife. Mr Trevor DeClean, why did the Prime Minister resign? Well, I think he was probably under a lot of strain and I think his health wasn't improving, uh, Paul. Uh, you don't get out of heart attacks uh, by being Prime Minister with all the strain that's been on him lately and uh, the polls weren't helping him. He had a lot of sympathy now. Everyone would say, nice fella, good fella, but that's not what they were saying in the polls, was it? You think the health is a very important issue? I think it's the most important thing of all. Who watching out there, Paul, would say that your health's not the most important thing of all? And I think it was. What about the people such as yourself and Roger Douglas and Richard Preble? There are some who would say that you three really are responsible for driving an essentially good man out of office. Well, I don't think we have been, but I'm not going to be hypocritical enough to say it wasn't endeavoured to be done so. Certainly that was, I, whatever the view was, I supported Douglas. But on the other hand, the Prime Minister took on two of his fish and chip brigade mates that put him where he got and turned on them. And if you turn on people like Richard Preble, he's implacable. Uh, I wouldn't want him as an enemy. And uh, Roger Douglas was doing his very best for this country and uh, I think was largely responsible for our win in the 87 election. Now, why force go out of your way to force him out? And that's what occurred. But isn't the danger, isn't the danger now, it's all very well saying those things and some of them may be true, but isn't the danger that you don't have anyone else, or do you have anyone else in your view, Mr DeCreen, with the televisual appeal, with the charisma, with the wit? Yes, I think we're not only the three front runners, uh, Palmer, Moore and Douglas, I think there's others in our caucus, we've got a great depth of talent there. And I would have liked the Prime Minister's wit and charisma to return. He cracked a good one lately, described Helen Clark as so dry as to be combustible. That's a bit of the old longy, but we weren't getting much of it. And under the pressure that was on him, uh, that may be one of the reasons, uh, his health, all sorts of things, we weren't getting the charismatic longy that we had between 84 and 87. Mm. I've seen him on your show, Paul. And while it was pretty good, and I could understand you're a mate of his, that it wasn't simply coming across as he used to. I don't think that I am a mate of the Prime Minister's, Mr oh. Green, any more perhaps than than you are these days, but... Oh, I think you're a bit of a mate of mine, and I've got nothing personally against Longley. I've never personally attacked him in my life. The, 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 the three candidates who seem to be the front-runners, Mr DeCleen, Mike Moore, Roger Douglas and, and Geoffrey Palmer, can yes. any of those three really, realistically speaking, command a majority? I think yes, and I think that at least they'd be neutral and I think positive in the poll. It's, uh, it's not the PM's fault, perhaps, but the, the end of the day, he was not performing in those leadership polls. Trevor DeClean, thank you very much indeed. Ruth Dyson, Labour Party President, when did the Prime Minister tell you that he was going to quit? Uh, the Prime Minister informed me yesterday that he had made the decision finally to withdraw from the position of, of Prime Minister, and I spoke to him again uh, for several hours on and off this morning, uh, mainly in a in a hope to dissuade him from that decision uh, and then obviously uh, realised when he told Cabinet that it was a final decision. Did he tell you in person or did he tell you on the telephone yesterday? No, he actually told me in person. Mm. What was your very first reaction? Uh, was of great regret, I've got to say. Uh, I think the, the public in New Zealand and you would know that I have a great deal of time for the Prime Minister as a person. I've worked with him very closely over the last few months and enjoy uh, many of his talents uh, that he shows so well. Mr a Doctor Bill Sutton from Hawke's Bay is suggesting that um, the doctors have brought an end to David Longy's career, that he hasn't got long to live if he were to stay as Prime Minister. Do you understand the health? Do you understand that the health is a serious issue with the Prime Minister? Well, I certainly believe that it was a contributing factor. Uh, the Prime Minister indicated that very clearly in his press conference when he made the announcement. Do you understand that the Prime Minister has recently received from news from medical people about his health? No, I'm not sure that, that that's a new announcement. I just think that continued strain on somebody who has had major medical problems, such as the Prime Minister, uh, are not helpful. Obviously, retiring from a position of great stress and pressure is always conducive to better health than one enjoys at the moment. What qualities do you need to see tomorrow in the new Prime Minister? Well, I'm, uh, Very briefly, if you I'm, can. Cer I'm certainly ready to support the person who caucus endorses, but what I'd say to caucus is that they get one chance at the leadership to take us through to the election. That one chance is tomorrow, and I want them to get it right. They, they should make that vote count. If they pick Geoffrey Palmer, do you think there's an electoral positive there, an electoral, an, an electoral plus? No. I, don't, I don't think it's appropriate for me in my role as president to go into you know, who may or may not be better, wh which of the candidates would be preferable to us as the party. We'll be making those views known to caucus. That's the appropriate place for me to discuss that. Do you occasionally enjoy a little flutter, a little bet? 
No, I'm afraid I don't. Not at all. You wouldn't Unlike be interested my colleague in... Trevor, I don't, yeah. I don't bet at all. You wouldn't be interested in a small bet on, on who might be emerging triumphant tomorrow? No, I'm, pre I'm prepared to bet that uh, if the leadership is determined in a way that unites the caucus into the election, uh, I'm prepared to bet that we'll win the, the 1990 election. Very well, Ruth Dyson. No punt from Ruth Dyson. Trevor DeClean, would you be having a small punt for tomorrow? Well, I'll support Douglas, but if I had a punt, I'd pick uh, the uh, Palmer-Douglas combination. Frankly. Yes, but you know that Douglas, I mean, Douglas is unacceptable to a large number of the Labour Party. Douglas is gone, his time has passed. Oh, I don't believe that. I think uh, we'll get those Labour Party people back and we'll get the middle vote. It's the middle vote that wins elections in the finish. All the loony left have gone with Anderton and some of the people we've got now are far more sensible. Laurie Hunter joined the backbenchers in 1935. It was the era of Michael Joseph Savage, an era of idealism led by a man still revered for his humanity. And there's never been anyone since who could fill Joe Savage's boots, as far as Laurie Hunter's concerned anyway. That was until the era of David Longy. I s said to many people, we've got another Joe Savage. Now that was my summing up at that time. And what did you mean by that? I meant we had a man that was uh, as uh, trustworthy and as, uh, as um, kind, and that sort of thing, as Joe Savage. And it, uh, it, it really hurt me to think that he, that he had so many people uh, call, calling him a liar and a thief and all this sort of thing, uh, that uh, I felt so very sorry for the man. And uh, because I knew he wasn't that type, I, I knew that. Do you think that, as some critics suggest, that the party, the leadership, was hijacked by a new right? I think it was hijacked by, uh, by uh, what's his name, Douglas. I think Douglas, Douglas was stabbing Longy in the back all the way through. And it brings him back, back to see exactly what was happening in when, uh, when uh, John A. Lee took to Joe Savage. And uh, the, the, the Douglas is, is uh, operating exactly the same way, in my opinion. You're sad to see David Longy go? Extremely sad. Extreme. It's re extremely sad. And I know there are a lot of others too. Extremely sad. The following story comes from the TVNZ collection held by Nga Taonga Sound and Vision. Ruth Richardson served as the Minister of Finance in Jim Bolger's national government from 1990 to 1993. Not only did she continue the reforms of the previous Labour government, she also expanded them. Benefits were reduced or abolished and unemployment was predicted to rise. Opposition came from across the political divide, including the former National Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, Robert Muldoon. On the 7th of April, 1991, Muldoon appeared on the Frontline programme. Sir Robert Muldoon packed his bags this week, but not before suggesting that the Minister of Finance should also pack hers. Sir Robert is on his way to South Africa. He thinks Ruth Richardson should be on her way to political oblivion. He claims her economic policies are fatally flawed. I spoke to Sir Robert just before he left. Sir Robert, you say Ruth Richardson must stop thinking and speaking in clichés and slogans, and she must formulate credible policies for growth and the provision of jobs. Now, I'm sure if she were here, she would say that's exactly what she is doing, and the old ways, especially the old ways as practised by you, cannot deliver, and that's why she's repudiating those old ways. Now, what's wrong with her argument? Well, you say that she would say that ex exactly what she's doing, but I don't think you meant that quite literally. She would not say that she's thinking and speaking in clichés and slogans. She's formulating credible policies yes, for growth and jobs. Uh, they're not obvious. Uh, the public out there uh, cannot see them. What the public sees and what I see 
is a continuation of the failed Treasury policies of the last six years, plus labour market deregulation, and again, all these clichés and slogans about level playing fields and uh, it'll all come right and we've lost the work ethic and so on. You can't have a work ethic unless you've got a job. Now, that's what it's all about there, but the reference to my policies, I don't think she said that precisely. I don't think she'd dare because uh, my policies worked in very difficult times uh, when we had a massive decline in our terms of trade, the relative value of our exports is against our imports. And during those nine years, the exports of manufactured products, and these are the ones that produce the jobs, increased eightfold from $260 million a year to well over $2,000 million a year. That's the failed policies of uh, my prime ministership. Well, I think she would probably point to, what is it, an average of 1.2% GDP growth during those of nine years. Of course she would. And say that's not good enough. Nor, in fact, is the growth rate under other governments as well. Uh, yes, it's actually a good deal higher than the average of the last six years and the average, uh, well, it's only six months yet, but uh, the last year, of course, which she won't point to, was 8.5% in real terms for the year uh, to June 1984, and uh, she perhaps might say, well, we had a price and wage fridge on, uh, and, you know, that's bad. But it's not bad to have 8.5% growth, real growth in the economy in a single year with an inflation rate of 4.4%, is well, it? Well, it was low because you wouldn't allow inflation. You regulated yes, it out of existence. Yes, so I should have allowed it. Is that what you're saying? Well, we had a series of controls like a command East European economy and it just well, doesn't Well, you can use all a... these stupid terms if you like, uh, but what the people are saying now, including a lot of young people, is Rob... We didn't know how well off we were in your time. Let's look at what she's doing, because I'd like to know in precise detail just where she's yeah. going wrong. Now, she's trying to bring government expenditure down to more or less the level of its income over a, a three-year period, That's right. thereby reducing pressure on interest rates. That's, right. That's got to be good for jobs, good for growth. You can do it much more easily than that. You see, uh, the Reserve Bank last year was holding interest rates up and they were holding the exchange rates up, and they can do that in reverse. Without this cutting back on government spending, which is creating more unemployment and increasing the internal deficit, when you cut back on health and education, in fact, you put people out of jobs, people who in many cases are at the very least semi-skilled, and in many cases skilled, and I'm talking about nurses, for example, now, you just increase unemployment, you increase the dole from people who are being sacked from uh, jobs that are paid for out of the public purse, and you put up uh, that deficit that uh, she's so worried about. Well, now, if at the same time interest rates are coming down and jobs are created, that will provide the base for more taxation and, and right. growth. Yeah, that's exactly right. And you can bring them down without this massive cut in government spending which has a negative effect on the economy and growth that reduces in the, economy. the government's need to borrow and, and that's how she's proposing yes, to bring the deficit and see, thereby interest rates down. She's, uh, she's swallowed these treasury cliches uh, that you bring down uh, the um, interest rates by cutting back on the internal deficit but uh, the Reserve Bank showed us last year uh, that you can also manipulate interest rates irrespective of government spending. And that's a much better way if cutting back harshly on government spending creates more unemployment. Uh, she, I think, doesn't realise this, but it's very simple, it's very clear. I could explain it to her without any difficulty. Do you then disapprove of the benefit cuts? No, by and large, I approve of the general approach. I am totally opposed. I think it's uh, disgraceful that we have hit war disability pensions. They're not social welfare benefits. I think it is disgraceful that uh, this government has hit those ex-servicemen, and there are few of them left, who had war disability pensions. The others I'm not so excited about, frankly, 
But we're doing it for the wrong reasons. Well, it's a good idea, isn't it, for there to be no incentive to be on a benefit as to being in the workforce? Yes, and there again, uh, I'm afraid Miss Richardson's got it wrong. Uh, she's saying that all the DPB people and dull people are bludgers who'd sooner be on those benefits than getting jobs. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of them who'd sooner be in jobs, but there are no jobs. What she should be concentrating on is providing growth which in turn will provide jobs, and particularly in this export field, and again particularly manufactured exports, which I proved in my time can be increased eightfold in nine years if you've got appropriate policies. And that brings back people into jobs. What are those appropriate policies? Are you talking about a return to subsidies and protectionism? No, again, you're starting to use cliches, you see. Uh, this is what she and the Treasury people do. What you do is play to your strength. You bring down the value of the New Zealand dollar, you bring down interest rates, uh, not in the way she's talking about, but the Reserve Bank can do it, just as they have uh, kept them up. Wait a minute, uh, you just talked about a devaluation. Yes. So you abandon the float? No, I didn't say that. Did the Reserve Bank abandon the float when they kept the dollar up last year? No. How would you effect your devaluation? By doing exactly what the Reserve Bank did last year, but in reverse. And uh, if you want to know precisely how to do it, you ask Dr Brash because he'll tell you how he did it in reverse the last year. What is the magnitude of the devaluation you think is necessary? I would think at least 10%, probably 15 Now, what that does is help the exporter as against the importer, makes the importer's job harder, makes the exporter's job easier, whether he is a farmer or a manufacturer or even a domestic producer, who is trying to battle cheap imports from Taiwan. Well, a lot of imports will be dearer because of the devaluation. Exactly. What about That's the point. In inflation? Uh, 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 you don't seem to follow me. That's exactly the point. That if these cheap imports from Taiwan and Fiji go up in price because of a devaluation, the New Zealand manufacturer who's trying to compete with them, failing and putting off staff onto the dole, will get a better run keep the staff on, maybe even expand a little if interest rates are down and it's not such a risk to increase his overdraft so he can expand. Aren't we going to see a sort of devaluation by attrition anyway? Isn't it, isn't it going to occur automatically over a period well, of time? Well, it might if you um, go home, get on your knees and pray. I'm talking about doing it consciously. Doesn't Ruth Richardson at least deserve more time before you dismiss her policies out of hand? Doesn't she need at least till the end and, of this year, as Michael Laws has said? Before you say, this isn't going to work. Michael Laws. <laughs> nice bloke. Uh, yeah, give her time. If she carries on the way she's going, however, and doesn't change her policy, the kind of time I'd give her uh, would be a different kind of time. But also it's true, isn't it, that she's less likely to succeed if she's undermined by backbench carping. Yes. I don't want her to succeed in continuing the present policies because they're disastrous. And unless backbench carping causes her to change her policies, I said the other day, and I repeat, that Jim Bolger has got to get a new Minister of Finance or he won't last more than three years as Prime Minister. Now, the public out there know that. But these are National Party policies and you're a member no, of that team. No, they're not. They're not? No, look, you were around at election time and presumably you were watching what was happening. We were campaigning on the policy that the economic policies of Douglas and the Labour Party were wrong and disastrous. And in every one of my uh, public meetings, I said, who voted for Treasury? Not a hand went up. And I said, well, they're the government. Treasury are, the st are still the government under Miss Richardson, plus labour market deregulation. This is not what we campaigned on. We campaigned on changing these policies and getting the economy moving again. Well, you campaigned on balancing the books by 1993, which is what she's trying to do. No, I repeat... I that know that was a target and not a promise. Yes, that's what you should have said first time round. Uh, it was a target, but not a promise. And it could never be a promise. Similarly, the we will not raise income tax. No. If you say we will not raise income tax and we will eliminate the internal deficit by 1993, 
you are throwing away two very important economic weapons and we can never get it right if we do that. Just in passing, do you think income tax should be raised? Yes. Not just the top rate. I think the 24% rate should be raised by about 2%. And uh, the people who pay at that kind of level wouldn't really notice it. It would bring in over a billion dollars. And uh, it wouldn't do the damage that these uh, cuts in, for example, health expenditure. The terrible things that are happening in the field of health. I think Simon Upton is a highly intelligent young man. And I think he realises that some of the things he said months or so ago won't work. And he's rethinking them. Uh, and I have, have some confidence that he might get it right. But no, we should not uh, say, no, we will never increase income tax. No other Minister of Finance in the world would say a thing like that. What is the extent at the moment of backbench disenchantment with the Minister's policies? How do you quantify dissent? How many, how many dissenters are there? Lots. Significant numbers? Yes. Enough to affect a change in policy, do you think? I hope so. You see, we've got now, fortunately, uh, a tremendous increase in the number of our members who come from the big cities and the big provincial cities, something that in the National Party we haven't had for a long time. They know what's happening. They know who's hurting. They know why they're hurting. And uh, regardless of whether they say it in public or not, privately and even in caucus, they're voicing their concern. I have spoken out in the last week because I was not going to speak out, but when she made that State of the Nation speech in Christchurch... And it was clear that these foolish policies are embedded in her mind. I said to myself, it's time, Rob, that you said something. Do you think the Prime Minister is entirely happy with these policies? No, I'm sure he isn't. He's got a problem. I mean, at what stage do you say my Minister of Finance is wrong in public? Uh, but I'm sure that Jim Bolger is astute enough to know that, in fact, she is not only wrong, but the public knows she's wrong. And uh, we're going to lose a lot of seats in 1993 and maybe even the election. Do you think he would be change. inclined to replace her, though? I hope that Cabinet and caucus can cause a major change in her attitude and policies. And he, the Prime Minister, finally is the one who is at the heart of it. When should he act? Now. Are there others in Cabinet who disapprove of her policies? Oh, yes. Would you care to tell us who they are? No. You talk to them one by one. How many Cabinet Ministers do you think? I, no, don't need to talk I, to them. I haven't counted them up, but I know that she hasn't won all her battles in Cabinet. But uh, for my mind, she's won too many. If she goes, who should replace her? Are you seeking your old job back? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. No, um, I'd do it if I was offered it, but I'm not going to be offered it. Uh, but there are two or three ministers who could do it. Uh, most of them have got very important jobs themselves. But uh, I'm not saying, you know, Ruth Richardson's got to go. I'm saying Miss Richardson has got to change her policies and cease being a prisoner of Treasury and their failed policies. But the lady is not for turning, as she's told us I'm many times. I'm afraid that's so, and uh, if that is the case, she's got to make up her own mind. Uh, if that is the case, for the good of this country, she has got to go. Well, we invited the Minister of Finance, Ruth Richardson, to respond to Sir Robert's attack. She declined, but in our Beehive studio now, we have none other than the Prime Minister. Good evening. Good evening. Now, Sir Robert doesn't think you'll be Prime Minister very long unless you get rid of your Finance Minister. What do you say to that? Well, let's be quite clear, Lindsay. I support the Minister of Finance. I appointed her to the job. Uh, but there is one very clear distinction between the time when Sir Robert was Minister of Finance. He was Minister of Finance and Prime Minister. Ruth Richardson has also got a Prime Minister that she has to persuade on policies. And therefore, there's more checks and balances in the system, and they're going to stay there. And um, let's, let's put to one side any suggestion that I'm going to uh, remove the Minister of Finance from her position. Does she have a difficult job persuading you of the correctness of those policies? I listen to all ministers very carefully when they have a proposition to put to me either directly, Lindsay, or in Cabinet. 
and I weigh up the merits, the pros and cons of the proposition. And I do that on the positions that uh, Ruth brings to Cabinet or anybody else. But I want to say uh, to your viewers that, look, we can't just look backwards for solutions. For goodness sake, we've just had that earlier program telling about all the problems this country's got. And I find it incredible that so many New Zealanders want to put a tick by the status quo as if that was all right, that if high unemployment, massive debt, low investment was all good and therefore we should stay with it. But what Sir I'm Robert saying actually to New claims, Zealanders, Sir Robert what, claims that you're not happy about the alternative yeah, policies, well, what that I, you're can uneasy. I just, can I just respond to that? What I'm saying to New Zealanders, I'm not happy with New Zealand as it is. I do intend to effect some change. We must achieve faster economic growth than Sir Robert achieved in his eight years, as, uh, what, yeah, nine years as Prime Minister, which was about 1% per annum. If this country is to pull itself out of the hole, it has to do better than that. Well, he says you're going to plunge us deeper into the hole with these policies. You're going to dampen down demand internally. The economy is already depressed. It'll be a full-on depression. No, not so. But the difference also between the early 70s and the early 90s is that we now have a country that is the most heavily indebted small industrial nation in the world. We can't just work on the presumption of borrowing our way out of trouble. We now really have to earn our way out of trouble. And, and that's what the Eurelia program was part and parcel of that. How do we get a more productive New Zealand in industry? That's how we'll get our way out. But earlier it's governments, not a including personality. your own, contributed heavily to this indebtedness. Pardon? Earlier governments, including your own, one would say particularly the national government that gave us Think Big, contributed significantly, heavily, to this indebtedness. It's a bit rich now to be making the whole country suffer and those least able to afford it, isn't but, it? But, Mr Perigo, you put that as if there is some alternative. So Robert we stated could, an alternative, can, can which just, is the kickstart the devaluation. Can I answer the question? The you devaluation put, is the question. Can you put it to you put it to me that there is some simple alternative? Sir For Robert example, that. that I can ignore the debt, I can ignore the unemployment, I can ignore the crash in New Zealand's international credit rating. I have to say to you, I can't do that. I have a responsibility as Prime Minister to take New Zealand out of its present difficulties into a better and more prosperous future. What's now, wrong with his devaluation proposal? Well, let me talk about devaluation for a moment. Uh, I'm fascinated that Sir Robert wants devaluation. We all know he fought violently against devaluation, strongly against devaluation, at the change of government in 1984. What's been the history of New Zealand on devaluation? We've devalued, continued to overspend, devalued more, continued to overspend, devalued more, and here we are with the New Zealand dollar, now worth not a great deal more than half the US dollar. The first time I went to the United States, sometime in the early 70s, the New Zealand dollar was worth about $1.20 US. How low do we want the dollar? I've never seen any country in the world anywhere become prosperous by a series of devaluations. If that worked, the Latin Americans would be the wealthy nations of the world. They're not. They're the basket cases. It would seem, though, from what Sir Robert says, that you haven't persuaded caucus of that. You haven't even persuaded cabinet. Oh, so he says. Quite wrong. Quite wrong, of course. Uh, cabinet and caucus are persuaded. Well, sure, I have those who disagree. Sir Robert had those who disagree. He had his uh, Derek Quigley's, he had his, you know, Marilyn Wearings and Mike Minogue's. I've got one or two that disagree. But the cabinet and the caucus support the policies that we're bringing forward into legislation and are articulating. And um, they will continue to do so because I work in a constructive and cooperative approach with my colleagues. I work issues through with them, take them through to the logical conclusion as far as I can, and I will continue to do that. Yes, but what we have here, Prime Minister, appears to be open warfare. This is more no. than just a healthy debate that you no, pride yourself on encouraging. No, it's not open warfare at all. Uh, we've had many economic debates in caucus. We spent a lot of time at the three-day Rotorua conference talking about economic policy, welfare policy, social policy, and all of that. And we will continue to do that because it's very, very important. What I believe most New Zealanders understand is that our country, through a series of factors, is now in some real difficulty. So the Minister and has we your... Can't, we can't just look for some soft option. Yes, we're we really familiar, have we're to familiar front with up the, and face we, it. We are familiar with the rhetoric. The minister no, that's has not the rhetoric, the, that's the facts. The Minister has your full support? My, of course she has my support. I wouldn't have appointed her five months ago if she didn't have my support. And you're not about to fire her? I'm not about to fire her, Lindsay. No, well, I'm 
tend to work with her and my other cabinet colleagues to take New Zealand to a more prosperous future. Would you like Sir Robert to stay in South Africa for a rather long time? No, not at all. I'm looking forward to him coming back and uh, uh, telling us what he saw over there, but uh, you shouldn't get excited about it. Prime Minister, thanks very much. Thanks, and uh, we'll be back in a moment. Those interviews were broadcast on the Frontline program on the 7th of April 1991. The following week, Ruth Richardson appeared on the program. It's been a baptism by fire for Finance Minister Ruth Richardson since she took office six months ago. Not only has the economy stubbornly remained in the doldrums, but the Minister's strategy for reviving it and returning it to a growth path has come under increasing attack from her own backbench. That strategy's key components are attacking the government deficit to reduce pressure on interest rates, labour market deregulation and avoiding these so-called quick-fix solutions of the past, such as devaluation and tax increases. A criticism of this approach culminated in the scathing attack on her by former Prime Minister and Finance Minister Sir Robert Muldoon on Frontline last week. She made that State of the Nation speech in Christchurch and it was clear that these foolish policies are embedded in her mind. I said to myself, it's time, Rob, that you said something. Jim Bolger has got to get a new Minister of Finance, or he won't last more than three years as Prime Minister. And while the Prime Minister was quick to defend his minister, the scene was set for a showdown with a supposedly growing number of dissidents at Thursday's caucus meeting. In the event, Miss Richardson trounced them. But having won that battle, will she win the war? The war to generate growth in the economy. For the moment, growth remains static. The big drain on our resources, the overseas debt, is now more than $50 billion. The balance of payments deficit is possibly as high as $5 billion, although precise information is not currently available. The government deficit is $1.4 billion as opposed to a projected surplus of $89 million last budget night. And unemployment continues to rise. The good news is that interest rates are falling and inflation continues its downward trend. Figures due out this week are expected to indicate an annual rate of less than 3%. Public confidence, however, is also falling. The latest One Network News Halen poll shows that economic pessimism is at its highest level since polling started 15 years ago, with three times as many people disapproving of the government's handling of the economy than approving of it. And Labour, overall, six points ahead of National. Well, Minister, I wonder if those poll results don't lend credence to Sir Robert's claim last week that if you don't resign as Minister, or at least change your policies, this government is history. Oh, Lindsay, this country is history if we don't face up to some very serious and deep-seated problems with this economy. And they didn't accumulate the day we took office. They have spent decades building up, and we're not going to shift them in days. What we could do in days was what we did do. We said that we were going to give growth a chance. We said that New Zealand had to shift from a lot of spending to put more resources into those who earn for us, our businesses, those who trade for us. But we said that this was a matter of a comprehensive program to lift the level of earnings in this country. We all want to be a fair and prosperous society. The trouble is we haven't had the policies that have achieved that. The trouble is perhaps the way you're going about it. That's what an increasing number of voters suspect. That's what Sir Robert claims. Voters are not getting what they thought they were voting for on election day. Right. They're getting a continuation of Rogernomics with labour market deregulation. The evidence is that's not what they want. Oh, on the contrary, what New Zealand wanted was a government that was prepared to tell them the truth. We've done that, and that is bound to produce an initial negative reaction. But the positives are there, the payoff is there already for a strategy that says, hey, New Zealanders, it's a matter of lifting our game, it's a matter of shrugging off the performance and the attitude that has put us on this low growth path. So when I went to Gisborne on Friday, for example, the water side is there, 
See, they didn't want part of the past approach. They worked back-to-back -back shifts to shift uh, logs and produce across that Gisborne wharves because that's where the wealth came from. In other words, we are a government that is going to help New Zealand shrug off poor economic performance. You don't seem to have convinced New Zealand of that yet. There is, as you know, a great deal of disenchantment and outright anger out there. You yourself personally have been splattered with paint and burned in effigy. And people are angry about the broken promises. They don't believe your excuses for those broken promises. And at the very least, you must acknowledge a failure to communicate adequately. What the government has is a sound strategy. Overwhelmingly, the caucus approved of that strategy. What we must do is communicate how we turn the negatives into the positives. That responsibility I accept. Look at interest rates, for example. Look at the way in which people are now understanding that it's about our trading, our marketing, our exporting effort that we're going to guarantee this fair and prosperous society. But they don't. They disapprove of your handling of the economy by three to one. I think what they disapprove of is having had to confront decades of poor performance. That's what the government thoroughly disapproves of. And that's why we're making this big shift in our performance, the big shift in attitudes, saying to New Zealanders, fairness and prosperity will only come off the back of better work, will only come off the back of better exporting, will only come when you've got a government that is prepared to face up to the fundamental problems and not put its short-term political skin ahead of the country's public interest. And Sir Robert would say that you're speaking in claptrap and clichés, and there's probably a chorus of people around the country saying that right now. Oh, I'm speaking common sense. If you don't earn, you can't spend. How can we sustain a very good health and education system if we don't have performance in this economy? We've got to face up to systems that are not working for us. Sir Robert may not like uh, my determination and the government's to confront the reality, but that is the common sense of the situation, and that's where the caucus is taking us. But, Minister, how can you have a work ethic when there's no work available? Well, you see, how do you have work in this country? We will get work by being a country that trades in a better fashion, exports in a better fashion, a country that doesn't undermine the work ethic by making it easier to be on welfare than to be in work. Look, we've done so much to undermine good economic performance in this country. We've done so much to undermine good health and good education performances. We've gone, done so much to undermine New Zealanders being able, in a flexible way, to work to their strengths. That undermining has now stopped. But who's done all that undermining, Minister? Not New Zealanders. And this is probably the source of a lot of resentment. You make it sound as though we're a nation of malingerers, as though we personally have committed some unspecified crime against the economy for which we must now be punished. That's the way you make it sound. No. New Zealanders over time have expected more than we have earned, and governments have given them comfort in that. This government is now facing the reality that the choices of the past, more spending, more taxing, more borrowing, those choices are not available to us. It's just the common sense choice now, which is that we have to earn that standard of living. You can't blame somebody who has been a victim of poor policy. What you can do is blame a government if it doesn't have the courage to face up to what has been poor policy and take New Zealanders from what has been a pretty negative economic performance into the positives that will come if we become a more competitive, more productive society. Well, Sir Robert says that under his wicked ways, manufactured exports rose eightfold in the nine years that he was Prime Minister. Is that a negative economic uh, performance? We are not going to make progress by looking in the rear vision mirror. I mean, we've had extremism in the past, the extremism of controls, the extremism of cost plus, the extremism of borrowing what we couldn't service. Gone is that extremism. We now have the common sense of exports. This government, for example, is shifting resources from spending to earning, shifting into that export sector. We know that it's that that is going to underwrite this country's standard of living. Minister, I'd like to uh, look at your strategy in more detail in a moment. We've got to um, generate some revenue of our own right now. We'll be back with Finance Minister Ruth Richardson shortly. And we're back talking to the Minister of Finance, Ruth Richardson. 
Minister, the whole point of the exercise that we're going through now is growth and prosperity. One question that hasn't been answered satisfactorily, if at all, is how do you get growth and prosperity by, in effect, engineering a depression, taking hundreds of millions of dollars out of circulation with these benefit cuts, firms sell less, go out of business, you have more unemployment, more expenditure on the dole, less tax revenue, a worsening deficit, more pressure on interest rates, no growth. Bingo, we're back where we started. There's only one way to engineer, to stir growth and prosperity, and that's through our trading performance. Our fortune lies beyond these shores. And that's the big switch that is occurring in New Zealanders thinking, in their performance. That's why the performance of the watersiders in Gisborne is so important. They're signing up to an export strategy. That's where our wealth base will come from. That's how we will fund the services that are so important to any civilised society. But if you engineer a depression at home first, of what value will all these exports be? Oh, there will be bad times at home if a government doesn't put its finances on a sound footing. Under the policies of which Sir Robert spoke, we actually had a country that was having declining earning power, rising unemployment, high inflation and high interest rates. This government has already given the business sector fresh heart, bringing down interest rates by not taking the chicken way out, which is to increase taxes, but by spending its money more wisely. For example, unemployment is a very, very big item of public expenditure. And we've got to make sure, and we'll be making announcements this week, that while people are unemployed, they don't lose the skill and the will to work. And yet we've had access programs in this country that I found in Gisborne again, for example, costing $30,000 per job compared to another access program in Gisborne costing $3,000 per access job. Now there's got to be a lot of waste in a scheme that costs 10 times more than it needs. My point is that there's going to be more unemployment as a result of your taking money out of circulation. It was no option for us to continue to spend money that we didn't have. That was a formula that had made us poor in the past because what that means is higher interest rates, more pressure on the dollar, less profitability for exporting. Look, what we're doing, in short, is the government is shifting over in the bed. It is taking less resource, leaving more in the hands of private individuals and the private sector. They are the ones who are going to invest and to employ. Where are they going to get their money from? They're going to get their money by doing as manufacturers are doing, looking to the export market, by doing as, as traders in wood are doing, looking to the export market. That's how we're going to lift this country's performance. And it would help them enormously if you effected a 10 to 15 per cent devaluation, as Sir Robert suggested last week. Get the Reserve Bank to manipulate interest rates and bring the exchange rate down. Well, we're bringing interest rates down by market means. And if you have a look at the argument for a crude devaluation that Sir Robert advocated, when I was born in 1950, one New Zealand dollar bought a dollar forty American. Now it will only buy 58 cents, but we're not twice as wealthy. I mean, what a devaluation does, a crude engineered devaluation, is it masks the real problems. It masks what's happening on the Cook Strait ferries at the moment, where seamen are striking to protect privilege and cost plus. It masks the problems that were happening in the public sector. Huge waste in public money. Look, it's only by the fundamental reforms that you can get the market to work for you. And I take the same view as the Governor of the Reserve Bank, which is that there is room for a market-induced decline in the dollar. It should be the market that dictates that, not ministers. Yes, but how quickly will it occur? Well, it has already occurred since Sir Robert made his comments last week. But it's not a costless strategy. The decline in the dollar between September and December last year put another $2 billion onto our international indebtedness. That makes our international debt 75% of all we earn, compared to Australia where it's about 40%. You know, I don't think that New Zealanders appreciate what a dangerous level of debt we have and how important it is to take all those steps that are consistent with better earning through exports, we've got to earn our way out of our problems. Yes, but I think what perplexes your critics as you address the problem of the government's own deficit is that you could actually get rid of it in one fell swoop 
with a tax increase. Put the burden on those best able to sustain it rather than on those least able to sustain it, which is what you've done. Well, governments have taken that lazy way out in the past. They've just heaped a new tax onto the shoulders of those who are meant to be saving and earning where the investment belongs, where the incentive belongs. I can't think of a better way to hit confidence for six than for say we're not going to tackle our spending problems, we will allow that wasteful expenditure, but we'll send the bill to private individuals. Look, what we want is the incentive to invest, to employ, to save. We desperately want confidence, and a government not prepared to put its own finances in order is not going to communicate that confidence to the private sector. But Minister, it would be so easy and so quick. Let me put a suggestion to you. If you put four cents on the top personal tax rate, mm -hmm. you bring in $320 million. Four cents on company tax, another $320 million. Two cents only on the bottom rate, you bring in $830 million. Now those are not punitive tax increases. They leave our tax rate still competitive internationally, but they bring in $1,470 million. There's your deficit gone. They knock the confidence for six at the very time when we have to give New Zealand firms, and I'm talking now, say, small businesses, you blithely talk of an increase in that company tax rate. You talk of an increase on most of their workers. Why should they believe a government that says, look, we need to have better incentives to save and to work when a government is penalising them for that incentives? We're not going to penalise effort. We patently want to encourage it. But if all of this is valid, Minister, how is it that the Institute of Economic Research is just about to release its quarterly survey of business opinion, which shows an unprecedented degree of gloom, despondency and job shedding in the business sector? That is the legacy of the past policies of which you are referring to. Uh, a set of policies that have said, let's not face up to the responsibility to earn, let's just try and devalue or inflate or borrow or tax or spend our way out of our difficulties. We will get the confidence of the New Zealand firms when we show we're a government that's got a sound strategy, that will sort out our own finances, that will encourage a switch to exporting, and a government that will stick to its guns. Look, it's not easy for us as a government. It's not easy for the country. But we won't be thanked if we take the short-term expedient that might be good politically but is hopeless for the economy. We don't want a government of that sort and we're not that style of government. Minister, thanks very much for joining us tonight. That interview with the Minister of Finance, Ruth Richardson, was broadcast on the 14th of April 1991. Kia ora, my name is Jim. I'm part of the security team here. Welcome to Parliament. I understand you're going to a select committee meeting today. As part of our process, we ask that you pass through our screening area, placing your items into the box provided, and when you clear the metal detector, you'll be able to uplift your items. Kia pai tora. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Abby, and I'm part of the security team here at Parliament. We ask that you please bring one of these stickers so that we recognise why you are here today. If you take a look at the board, it'll tell you which committee is in which room. Now you may walk on down the corridor and wait outside your room. Hi, I'm Rebecca Bonner, Clerk of Committee here at Parliament. It's awesome to see you here. It means that you're here today to present to the committee. If you look behind me, you'll see a screen and that will tell you whether or not the committee is open or closed to the public. If it's closed, just wait outside and one of our committee staff will be outside to let you know when you can come in. If it's open, come on in and sit at the back. We'll see you inside. Kia ora, I'm David Wilson, Clerk of the House of Representatives. Welcome to the room where you'll be speaking to a select committee. Shortly, the chairperson will invite you forward to speak to the members of the committee. Please don't feel nervous. Everyone here is really interested in what you've got to say. If you have any questions, please visit the Parliament website and then get in touch. From everyone here in Parliament, we look forward to seeing you here soon.
For some contemporary insights into the workings of Parliament, you can view a collection of short videos from the Spotlight on Parliament series. Just head to the New Zealand Parliament website at www.parliament.nz.